So Tom, thanks so much for uh, agreeing to speak with me today. Um, we've, we first um, came into contact with each other when uh, you responded to an email newsletter that I'd sent out with the InVita project. And uh, I think in, through that conversation, you know, I think we realized that we've got a few overlapping areas of interest. And um, I think it, it must have been about six months ago, maybe even longer. Um, we, we started that communication. Since then, I've moved to the UK and, you know, had a lot going on and have been less um, uh, interactive, I guess, the, um, with the outside world, really just trying to focus on everything that we need to do to move the family over here. Um, but I, I really wanted to talk to you because it sounds like, as I say, we have this um, overlapping areas of interest, podcasts, newsletters, um, productivity. Um, and so, yeah, um, maybe just to start off with, you could share a little bit about your context and um, why it is that you're thinking about some of these things, and then I'll do the same. Yeah. Um, so I am a physiotherapist. I graduated in uh, from Newcastle in England uh, 2017, I think. Um, so not too long ago, uh, uh, where I practiced for two more years uh, in Newcastle and a little bit in Lincolnshire, uh, by coincidences. I know where you are now. Um, uh, as a like senior uh, MSK physio and then a senior physio and a little bit of time in a pain service as well. Uh, I moved to the States over two years ago now. Wow, two and a half years ago. Um, and the short version of that is my wife is American and she's doing her postdoc here. Um, so we were in Michigan for a bit and we're now we're in Houston, Texas. Um, while I was in the States, um, lots of things happened, conspired against me to my kind of attempts to get accredited here. So COVID happened and so did, um, you know, as always, these things take longer than you think, as you might be experiencing now. So the, the visa, the green card process um, took, I think, about a year, maybe longer in total. Um, it should only have taken a few months. So basically, I sort of gave up somewhere along the way, actually getting accredited to practice here for now and thought, well, I'll, I'll switch to something that I am um, uh, maybe, to be honest, better at, which is kind of research and writing. Um, so at, the, at that point, I'd already done quite a lot of blogs, kind of longer, sort of quite in-depth blog posts, um, which had got some interest. And I was quite active on Twitter and had already developed something of like a clinical interest in sciatica just by accident, really. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do this and see if I can turn it into a job, which I just about have done. You know, I kind of make enough to justify spending my time on this but not enough, as much as I would do if I was practicing, and you know. Um, so now I research and write about sciatica, cord equina syndrome, and hopefully other things in the future, no intention of just being the sciatica guy. Um, and that's kind of what, where you know, I think probably before I went on this kind of self-employed, type journey um i was already very interested it's already kind of an infovore and interested in the things we're probably going to chat about today um like personal knowledge management and all that stuff but i think doing this made it like a professional necessity really um which is why i've kind of gone a bit more into it and and now i have a weird sort of job which is sort of semi-academic reading lots of academic papers and trying to be evidence-based about it, but also semi-clinical in terms of trying to be clinically useful to the people that read my stuff and semi-commercial in a sense in that I have to kind of keep people's interest and get them to, you know, put their credit card details into, into the internet for me, you know, to sell my books so that I can keep doing this. So I have a kind of a weird sort of self-employed position at the moment, which is, which I'm enjoying. So that's me. <laughs> That, that sounds really fascinating. Um, I, the idea of being an independent researcher is uh, something that I've only come across once before. Mm. Uh, the guy called Andy Matushak or something. Yeah, I, I love and, his uh, stuff. And yeah. he, yeah, he's, he's great. I really enjoy um, reading uh, his work. And he's one of the only other people who I've heard 
um, has been, you know, relatively successful at this idea of being a, an independent self-employed researcher. Mm. So I, I'd really love to hear maybe a little bit later about your experiences with publication and, you know, what are some of the challenges you experienced with that? But as you were talking now, I was also reminded of this idea of research debt, um, which is the idea that, uh, you know, as academics, we're pushed to uh, publish um, and the, the rate at which we publish is way more important than how well we explain what we publish. And uh, there's, I don't know if you're familiar with the 80,000 Hours podcast. Rob Wiblin, yeah, big fan. Yeah. 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 So I also read a lot of his stuff and the blog posts and podcasts. And um, he interviewed a guy called Chris Erler a little while ago. And um, Chris talks about the idea of research debt and links it to, um, uh, what is it? software debt or coding debt or technology debt the mm -hmm. idea is that you you get stuff out there quickly and it's kind of an ugly hack because you're solving a problem in the short term with no real thinking around how it's going to impact the way that you run things in the long term mm. and so um, the way that developers and um, uh, companies have to deal with that is that you know they build up this debt that they have to pay off every time they want to make a change to the system because it's this ugly hack that you have to work around all the time. And Chris Ola kind of takes that concept and applies it to research. And he says that the amount of time and effort that it takes new researchers to get to the cutting edge of their field is significantly higher than it needs to be because no one's taken the time to integrate all of the new knowledge that's being mm -hmm. formed. So we have all of these papers being published but if you're a new entrant to the field, you've got an enormous amount of reading to do to get to that kind of boundary of, of you know, where the cutting edge is. And Chris Ola makes the suggestion that if, you know, you might be able to make a bigger contribution to your field by writing really careful, um, well thought out essays that integrate the information that has been published in a variety of different venues. Mm -hmm. you know different journals blog posts podcasts so that all these people sharing all this information and by collating that in a, in a thoughtful accessible way you could be actually doing more to drive your field forward than just pushing out more academic publications and i thought that that idea has really resonated with me and um, i've thought about the idea of maybe trying to do something similar myself you know writing essays around areas that I think I have some experience in, but it sounds like, you know, what you're describing, the way that you approach your writing, um, it sounds like that's something that you're um, already doing, if not um, consciously. I don't know if that was your intent to, you know, to summarize and collate information in an accessible format. Um, I don't know if you could maybe talk about that mm. a little bit. Yeah, it, it's, I think my intentions and the kind of incentives that I give myself have shifted a little over time. So you mentioned this idea of an independent researcher, uh, which Andy Matushak is, as, as you mentioned, he, he researches sort of cognitive science related to learning and memory, as I understand it. And I think he funds himself by donations from people who think he's doing good stuff and he should keep doing it and mostly um, there are other, he's kind of in the Silicon Valley type world. So um, I think there's a lot of people with money to give him, which is another thing. Um, I know there's uh, a woman called Nadia Ekbal, uh, who um, did some independent research on open source software a while ago. And I read a lot of her stuff and the way she phrased it was she essentially did a PhD independently, um, funding the PhD through people funding people giving her money directly to study this thing how does open source software work because it's important to to the economy and to them and then in the book she wrote at the end of it publishing that and so that that was all like very attractive to me and, and kind of maybe more so than your average physio like attracted to sitting on my arse all day and reading and writing like i, I think it's some of my people's idea of a nightmare but i like that idea um uh, I think I quite quickly realized it's quite idealistic. I mean, especially in musculoskeletal care, um, the, the 
with that business model of people you know giving you money to research things just because they think it's important is kind of absurd i mean i'm sure if i opened a patreon account i could get something but at the end of the day there's not enough money going round, but also the problems to be solved are not sort of legible or tangible enough you know you, i can't say to people if you guys support me i will research and research and then i'll Kip come up with a cure for sciatica because realistically I know that's not going to happen um it's certainly not going to come out of reading pdfs you know that that's something that's going to take huge well-funded multi-center randomized control trials over many years if it's even possible um so I kind of over time changed my the incentives I was giving myself to um you know the, the best way to make this work is to focus on who I was before I left England, which is a clinician, an ordinary boring clinician in a GP practice or an outpatient hospital, hospital department. And to make what I'm doing as useful and interesting as I can to them. Um, so the newsletters that I put out tend to be quite interesting, like they're along, um, you know, curious little lines of thought for people who are interested in nerve pain, that type of thing. Um, and the book that I wrote, hopefully, is more towards the useful side of things. This is a different topic because it's not explicitly useful in the sense it doesn't tell you what to do. But I've had many people tell them that they find it useful because it gives them a better model of the world, um, which helps them to navigate clinical practice. And the book that I'm writing at the moment on quarter equina syndrome is I mean, until recently, I literally had a post-it note on my desk saying, write a useful book. It's going to be explicitly very, very useful to people. Um, and I hope that that will help, you know, the, the business model in a sense, which is the first book I wrote, as I say, was more on the interesting side of things. So it was kind of quite in depth about what's happening in a nerve root when there's a disc herniation, that type of thing. Um, and I think it's been very popular in the little world of people who are interested in that sort of thing already. Um, but I'm hoping that the next one in quadriquina syndrome, because it's useful, will then be recommendable. So people will say, oh, you had trouble with this patient, you should buy this book, and, and hopefully it'll have a little bit more of a, a lasting um, sort of life. Um, I forgot what your original question was, but that that's kind of how I move forward now is to think, well, what can I do that will come up at the end of the day with the most useful thing that people will um, pay me for, basically. Um, but at the same time, trying to keep, because sometimes usefulness and interestingness conflict, because um, the interestingness can be a distraction if you go too much into the, but trying to keep that, that interest in, in how curious and funny and weird the world of musculoskeletal pain is which i think is probably why a lot of people read the newspaper is new newsletter is they think they know that i'm going to tell them about some interesting paper they've never heard of which has some weird or wonderful thing about you know buttock pain or tingling in the calf or something that will be interesting so just trying to do those two things at once is seems to be working okay at the moment yeah well you know, it's, I, I really wish you all the success in the world because I, I love the idea of being able to support yourself just through reading and thinking and writing. Um, and, you know, coming from the academic world, I think that that privileged space where we uh, would have to kind of be separated from the world, the whole point of um, universities would be that you were separate from the world and you would not have to be bothered by the kind of mundanity of you know the the ordinary things that people are supposed to deal with um, that's disappearing and the amount of administration that is kind of coming into academia and managerialism is uh, problematic when it comes to the idea that you know you should have this privileged time to to read and to write and to think and to try and push ideas forward. And it sounds like you've, you know, moving towards a place where you are 
you know, getting closer to that ideal than I think most academics would uh, would feel that they're able to do. So that sounds brilliant. Um, it's interesting that you talk about, you know, trying to write a useful book. And for many years, I had a post-it on my noteboard saying, try to be useful. And that was kind of my driving um, inspiration for everything that I would do, whether it's postgraduate supervision or grant applications or writing papers, you know, how can I take what I'm learning and what I'm doing and try to be useful, whether that's a, you know, a tweet, a blog post, a podcast, um, you know, try to have everything that I do have some utility for someone else. So it's, it's really interesting to hear you say that. Um, the other thing you mentioned that I thought was super interesting was um, writing for an audience. And I think the way that you talked about that, it seems very much that your style of writing, and maybe you can describe, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but the, the way that you think about what to pay attention to, how to collate it, uh, you know, you talked about the, that, you know, the subtle difference between what's interesting and what's useful. Um, and knowing who you're writing for, um, understanding your audience seems to have quite a big influence on the way that you think about writing. Um, can you maybe unpack that a little bit? Because um, I must say that's something that I struggle with. Um, I'm really interested in lots of things and I try to pay attention to lots of things. And I think because I don't have a very clearly defined audience um, to produce things for, um, I find myself being pulled in lots of different directions. And, and that sounds like something that you seem to have dealt with quite well. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I still feel pulled in a lot of directions because even just for the experience level, you know, of the clinician, you, you learn so much in say your first two years as a clinician that you may as well be, you need to read a different book to help you, you know, um, the sciatica thing, it was kind of a convenient topic really, because for, for whatever reason, it's it, no one, had been interested in it for 10, 15 years or whatever. Like Louis Gifford wrote a lot about nerve root pain extremely well. And I, I had to hold off reading his book until I finished mine because I was just really worried that I'd realized we were writing the same thing and he was doing it better. Um, but he wrote about it extremely well, but for whatever reason, there's been a sort of forgetting. Uh, it's sort of been subsumed in the non-specific low back pain. Um, world um, and then I think people were really interested um, to hear again about okay there's these interesting specific aspects of radicular pain so and so there was this kind of cross um, or trans sort of throughout the stages of people's career I had very senior physios telling me that it was interesting and very junior physios and students so I was kind of fortunate with the topic I think um, whereas with something like quadriquina syndrome which I'm writing about now there's a it's much more, much more keenly aware that people, someone who's been practicing for 20 years and taken an interest in spinal pain will find the book very boring probably. So, um, but then it's just a case of, I'm trying to say, well, it's not, it's not for them. You know, be very clear that, try and see that as a, see it as a strength that, um, <sighs> In, in fact, I don't try and see it as a strength. I, I do see it as a strength that I'm going to, I'm writing for a very particular kind of person, which is um, new graduates and people in the first five years of practice, maybe, or people who have not, beginners to intermediates, basically. Um, it's not for students because they need to do something else. They need to just read a few papers and blog posts first. And it's not for spinal specialists because they're going to learn a few things but it's probably not worth them paying any money to do so um and that's very liberating it means i'll make i'll, I'll write a better book because it's target targeted isn't the right word but it's for someone so um whereas if you write something for everyone by definition it's going to be a bit crap i think um so and, and then there's the same thing with the the newsletter that's actually become more and more difficult over time because when it started, there was 300, 500, 700 subscribers. And I kind of knew that they were all either people I knew or people who followed me because they were really interested in nerve root pain. And I could write whatever I wanted. 
like I think the first edition was about some Swedish bit of um, like a, a, a bit of research done by a Swedish person, a guy just by himself about 40 years ago where he just audited his patients and the graphs were like hand drawn, you know, sometimes you see that in the old papers. And I just loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Um, people were interested, but now there's 2,500 subscribers. And I, every time I'm writing anything, I worry that I'm going to alienate a third of them. So that there's definitely that anxiety of like, oh, well, who is reading this? I don't really know. Um, do I just continue doing like being me, as they say, and just writing what I'm interested in? Is that like kind of authentic and the right thing to do? Or is the right thing to do to be professional about it and say, look, it's, this isn't about me, it's about them. I have to write something for them. But then at the moment, I'm kind of caught in the space between. So I don't know if there's a, I kind of definitely feel your anxiety, especially on the internet and Twitter, which doesn't really discriminate. You can't like segment an audience. Um, so if, if you, for example, and I know you write blog posts, have you not written one for a while or have I just not been getting I haven't written one for you a while. Yeah, <laughs> I thought I just suddenly thought I haven't got one of Michael's blog posts for a while. But you must think every time, like, potentially all my students could read this. Um, every physio in the world, every supervisor, and 80% of them are going to go, well, this is not for me. It's rubbish. Because <laughs> it's not, so it's quite difficult to, that's one of the big barriers every time I tweet now. It's like, there's enough people going to read it that it's going to be boring to most of them. Yeah. yeah, I, I mean that's a you're a hundred percent right. Um, so I use my blog as ways of almost thinking in public, mm. and uh, that's kind of what the YouTube channel is. Is I realized that there are very few, um, kind of frameworks for academics to approach their work. You know, you become an academic by applying for a job coming straight out of, out of your clinical practice. Mm. Um, you know, maybe you've got a post, postgraduate degree and maybe publish something. Um, but nobody tells you how to deal with the deluge of emails that come in. Mm. Um, nobody, you know, there are workshops to tell you how to write a better paper, but not how to structure your day, how to deal with incoming information, um, how to be a knowledge worker. Uh, so mm. there, there aren't very many frameworks. There's a, um, a guy called Carl Newport, you may have come across him. Mm. You know, I think he's one of the few people I've come across who's trying to approach the idea of knowledge work in a systematic and structured way. And I've found his thinking to be incredibly influential and useful. Um, and so I've uh, the, the YouTube channel is, is really to try and model the way I think about academic work um, as uh, like an example for, for uh, you know, early career researchers or people who are new to academia, or even maybe people who have been around for a while, um, who are, you know, they approach their day in a very reactive way. So they come into work, have no plan, they sit down and they, the first thing they do is open email. And, you know, straight away, you've just lost the first two hours of your day. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's kind of defined the YouTube channel. I kind of know what that's about. The Inbeat and newsletter, I know what that's about. I know who I'm writing for. That's, you know, physiotherapy educators. We pick a topic, write a few um, things that people might be interested in. But my blog is really just a, a random place to dump whatever happens to be interesting to me in the moment. And you're right. In that way, a student is going to read some of that and think, well, you know, what is he talking about? I've got no interest in this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been writing about AI uh, a bit lately. I think most of the people who read the posts are going to read that and think, ah, you know, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, but the difference is that I guess I'm not trying to cultivate an audience with the blog. Um, the blog really is, I think of it as a place to just dump ideas and to work through them in a kind of systematic and structured way to say, this is what I think about this idea. Um, where it sounds like you're, I think the stakes are a little bit higher for you um, because this is, you're trying to uh, maybe not call it a business, but you're definitely trying to generate revenue. Um, and, and so I think that that changes the stakes. It changes the way that you calculate um, how you're going to use that real estate. Um, so it, it, it is a little bit different. Um, you're right. Mm. Um, 
there was there was a couple of things that you talked about earlier. You've you've talked about your output and the fact that you write a newsletter, you're working on the second book, um, you're involved in podcasts. Um, so your your um your the artifacts that you're putting out there are varied, different media, um, maybe all aligned along the same topics. Mm-hmm. Um you haven't talked about the, your inputs. So, you know, we're all faced with an enormous number of inputs from Twitter, RSS, email, TV, YouTube. How do you make sense of everything that's coming in? How do you decide what to pay attention to? Um, there's a whole lot of things that are mixed up in there from entertainment to news, to personal interests, to research interests. Um, there's your topic interest. There's, I'm sure that you've got incoming information on writing, on reading. It's a lot of stuff. Um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about how you think about those different inputs and mm. a little bit about your strategy for dealing with them. I mean, I, th- I think, yeah, it's, I do think about this a lot and I hope I articulate myself well because I never have actually said any of this out loud, really. No one else, no one in my life is interested in this. I, 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 <laughs> I did try and talk to my wife about it, but, she, but the, I think one of the, the first things is to have because I think sometimes we put the cart before the horse with this sort of thing. Um, um, and there's no, we need to have like the end goal in mind, which is kind of a boring way of putting it, but some some sort of function for like, why are we looking for information? That like, I always, I don't know if this is the right thing to do. Like I always kind of say, take advice with a pinch of salt, but whenever anyone asks me, how should I do CPD? I say, well, just pick a project to work on so that it doesn't feel like you're doing CPD, you know? So right. think I'm going to write a blog post about the ACL or I'm going to start a podcast or something. And then all of a sudden you're no longer doing this abstract thing, CPD, you're just doing a project and you happen to be doing CPD along the way. And I think in terms of managing like the fire hose information that, that helps because like, I know, uh, exactly what my projects like I literally have a list of my projects both professional and like personal like we're moving house this year and that kind of thing so if I see a new blog post podcast anything like that I immediately know if it relates to a project and if it doesn't it's hard to justify spending time on it um unless it's purely for entertainment which is a different thing and and then that makes a decision easy as well because it's like well is this entertaining enough is it, is it better than whatever's on netflix because i think so so often people read things they feel like they're obliged to read and like like i've given up on keeping up with on the research on 95 percent of physio now i barely read the news i've got to say i check on the news but like i i kind of i realized that it it doesn't make me a better person to know what's in the like to know the ins and outs of the latest scandal or whatever and I try to kind of pick out what's important and know about the important things but you know try not to get buffeted by all the you know that's a big that's a totally different podcast but then there's so much news that you feel obliged to keep up with and you have to kind of realize that actually most of it is entertainment in disguise and you, you don't have to but um that helps and then once I kind of know what I want to pay attention to, I almost never pay attention to it in the moment. So if there's an interesting tweet, email, blog post, I'll I use an app called Todoist and um, I'll just click a button on my phone or laptop or whatever, and it goes into my inbox in Todoist. And then once every Friday, Friday afternoons, I go through everything in that inbox, which will be tweets, blogs, and also stuff like, you know, buy bread, pay this bill, that type of thing. And I'll realize that the tweets and blog posts and everything that I'd saved, most of them I don't actually want to read. So it was a good job that I didn't at the time. And then most of the ones that remain, I certainly don't want to read them now. So I'll put them into, um, if it's an academic paper, they'll end up in a file on Zotero. Um, If it's something that like, I don't, have any immediate need for but it's in my kind of spheres of interest or I feel like I might use it one day it'll go into Zotero Um, and if I have a more immediate need for it or it's like a very particular type of thing so if it's like 
oh, this pertains to this chapter in this book that I'm writing, or, oh, this pertains to this kind of nebulous topic, like uncertainty, or, um, I don't know, it doesn't have to be physio, of course, it could be anything, then it'll go into Rome, which I know you use Obsidian, I use Rome, and I'll just tag it with whatever I want, um, whatever I think will make it more useful, most easy to find later. Um, so basically the bottom line is that everything is captured, almost nothing I read at the time, unless I'm deliberately looking to distract myself, I'm just bored. Um, and that's like, if, if you, you're anything like me, which I suspect you are, that's like a very relieving thing because I, I don't have to worry that I'm missing out on information or, um, you know, there's this great paper that's passed me by or, I, or I, that I'll put it in a folder and forget about it somewhere. You know, there's a place for everything and everything's in its right place. Um, I suspect you have like a similar, um, a similar setup, which might be a bit more mine sort of emerged over time and um, it's a yeah. little bit chaotic but yours might be a bit more um, structured i think maybe yours sounds a little bit more organic um mm. in that it it sounds like it was something that evolved mm. uh, i think um i don't know if this is a good thing I, I can't say if it is if it is or not but i think that i took quite a um structured systematic approach to building a system i think i was quite intentional um, and it, this happened over a period of about 12 to 18 months. And I just, I became completely obsessed is not an unreasonable word to use, um, with, you know, all the productivity porn that's, um, and it, on the one hand, I think it was probably, good to go through but i came out the other side having i think risked that i didn't need to do all of that um and since then i've um i've started reading a book called four thousand weeks by oliver berkman which uh, i know you mentioned in in one of your emails um and it's interesting because i kind of came to the same point that that i think he's heading towards um and you've mentioned it a few times you ignore 95 percent of you know of physiotherapy you there's so much information out there to try and stay on top of even a tiny sliver of it is um is a fool's errand mm -hmm. and i think for a long time i was trying to build the perfect system which would filter out you know everything that was just noise and uh, make sure that i was getting really high quality signal and then making sure that I pay attention to that signal, extracting the most useful, valuable, interesting information, mm. and then converting that into something that I'd be able to put into an output, whether it's a blog post or an article or something. And I felt like I was just spending an enormous amount of time trying to tweak this system of processing information. Mm. And uh, I realized it was just untenable eventually. Um, but I spent a long time you know, trying to figure out how to make this thing perfect. Um, and now I'm, uh, the, you mentioned a liberating feeling and I definitely got to that point. And I think it came when we started planning our move to the UK, when our lives are just consumed with, you know, the, you would know the, the 10,000 small decisions and choices that need to be made. Um, in order to complete this, you know, fairly significant life-changing move. Um, and during that process, it became, you know, very clear, very quickly, that there's no way that I'm going to be able to pay attention to anything that was coming across my desk in the past. And turning away from it and just realizing that there's no way that you're ever going to be able to catch up. You've just lost six months of all of that, information and everything is fine <laughs> <laughs> nothing's actually happened that you've missed that uh, is relevant or yeah. important in in any way and it, it reminded me of uh, i don't know who, who it was that uh, said this when i came across it but someone was saying at the end of at the end of every month you can go to the wikipedia page on that month yeah. and there'll probably be 10 headlines mm -hmm. that were important mm. um and if you really want to, you can drill down, 
because Wikipedia will have those links into each of those topics. Mm. But you probably find just reading the Wikipedia page on that month that has just passed. Mm -hmm. I haven't quite got run to that. I still have enormous RSS feeds <laughs> that are coming in. But yeah. um, I think this conversation with you has uh, reminded me of the fact that um, there's quite a lot out there that I've got coming across my desk that I'm just ignoring anyway. So mm -hmm. I should probably just pull it out of uh, those feeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just distraction. Yeah. But that, and then, then there's the anxiety that you will miss something. And, you know, I every now and then have a purge of my kind of RSS and my uh, the newsletters that I subscribe to. And, and then I kind of worry, well, I wonder what maybe he, this guy has said something interesting and I've, I've missed it. Um, but yeah, I think we, I, I heard a, I've not heard that thing about the Wikipedia page before. That is interesting. The, the way I'd heard it expressed was, you know, if you were frozen in cryostasis for a hundred years and then someone de defrosted you, thawed you, um, then you'd only need two days in the library to catch up on what you'd missed, like the really important stuff. Um, and yet many of us spend two days a month, essentially reading the news and getting upset about it obviously it's very you know i'm kind of hesitating because i feel like it's a huge other topic and there's a sense to which we're both privileged to be able to kind of say that in some ways um or i don't pay attention to the news and um but i i really think it makes me a more going back to that word useful useful and helpful and better person to the people around me because we've spoken by email about being a parent and things like that and I just don't feel like me reading, I can't think of a recent event because we're, as we're talking, the news is full, filled with stuff that is actually really important, um, which is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But, you know, if we'd gone back a few weeks ago, I don't know what it would have been by definition. I haven't been really keeping up. But someone's always annoyed by the latest thing that Trump's said or... I don't know how useful it would be to the people in my life for me to know about that stuff and be angry about it. I, I don't think it would make me a better person, probably a worse person than anything. But, um, but maybe you can apply that to information more generally as well, uh, in the sense that, you know, it maybe it's a quite a selfish impulse to want to keep up with every kind of new paper that's published or to read every blog post on whatever the latest kind of ripple is in the socio sort of economic world. And maybe that's a selfish impulse. And if we're clear about why we're doing what we're doing in the world, whether it's the professional projects that we have or the kind of more nebulous goals that we have in life to be there for the people that uh, we mean something to, then maybe it's, maybe it's actually quite selfish. For me to subscribe to a hundred different newsletters and spend so much time reading them i don't know uh, no i think i agree with you 100 percent um the amount of time that i spend uh well i used to spend just trying to make sure that i go through that feed every day um you know there are a hundred things that are more important to to me and to the people around me that um, i could be using that time for mm. so i I'm just uh, I'm conscious of the time and the fact that we've been chatting for for quite a while, a little bit longer than I was expecting. Um, and, and I think the way that you were talking um, just a minute ago, I think that's a great way to to wrap things up. There are so many things that I'd love to chat to you about, a little bit more detail about the way that you approach your writing, um, the way that you take information from what you've captured and convert that into useful ideas. How do you choose the things that you're going to be sharing to your audience? So there's a, a lot that I'd really love to talk to you about. So um, maybe we could uh, catch up another time um, and uh, explore some of those ideas. Does that sound right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this was really nice. It's um, my, I know it's the afternoon for you. It's my Saturday morning. If I've had me coffee and I'm just, it's been a nice chat and it's nice to talk to someone who is not bored stiff by all this stuff, uh, maybe even interested by what I have to say. So uh, it was a real pleasure. Thanks, Michael. Good to finally meet you as well. Yeah. Tom, it's been really great. I really appreciate your time um, and I hope to catch up with you again soon.